we were reminiscing about how old we're getting because uh, uh, Jordan was, we, we're trying to figure out, you were 13, 14 maybe the last time I saw you. Oh, my daughter's getting married this weekend and she's 25. Yeah. All right. Well, we are going to be, I've never taught this book before because I've never been through this part of the, the New Testament. And uh, it's not one of those necessarily those books like you would go right to. It's the book of Philemon. And so uh, it's very short and uh, it's, it's interesting for a few reasons. One of them, I guess, above all of it is it's not one that's being written because of doctrinal things, not because of theological things. Uh, it, it is a companion. Um, we, we know about it because of what was going on at Colossae. I'm dropping everything tonight. So this would have been, um, this book would, it would, from all appearances, would have been uh, written at the same time as the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians. And so if you're looking at a map of that part of the world, think the seven churches like what we looked at in Revelation, like what we're doing on Sunday morning. And um, when you look at them and you do this arch that goes this way, you know, like I said, it began at Ephesus. That was the first of the churches. But from your perspective, thinking that this is the west coast of Turkey, the seven churches went in an arch like this, and the last one was Laodicea. Colossae would have been a little bit to the, to the south of that and a little bit to the east. And so Colossae had one of their, their kind of prominent figures, this guy Philemon. Well, what we get is in Paul's letter to him is kind of a way of saying, you know, all the old rules don't necessarily apply. What we have here is a guy who had a servant, or even you can refer to him as a slave, this, uh, this Onesimus guy. And, uh, and Paul knows that he's going to be going back to Colossae, but this is a runaway slave. And uh, Philemon was the person to whom he was indentured, and he, he had the rights to him, if you will. Paul is asking that since this guy ran away, what happened in his time when he was there, more than likely in his Roman imprisonment, though it could have been somewhere else. Some people think that his imprisonment may have been somewhere else. No, it doesn't really much matter. But when Paul wrote this, he was, uh, he was saying, look, while I was here in my imprisonment, uh, Onesimus got saved. And so when he comes back to see you, I'm just hoping that you treat him like, uh, like a brother. And so there again, the old rules wouldn't apply. Now, in the Roman world, if a, uh, if a, a servant had left and ran away, then there was a whole, you know, there was a whole legal thing of what do you do to bring them back and all the rest of that. You, you can see by the way that Paul deals with this that, uh, again, the, the, the regular rules of things wouldn't apply to brothers in the Lord. And so what you're going to see here, there obviously was repentance and there was, uh, there was going to be a reunion that was going to take place once he got there. Now you can see him mentioned in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. And so the, the, uh, the guy that's carrying the letter, Onesimus, is one of those guys. And so they would have dropped off the letter to the, to the Ephesians. Of course, they would have been coming from, uh, more than likely, from the east. So as they come across the water, they would hit Ephesus on their way down to Colossae. And since Philemon lived in Colossae, and one of the guys that is going to be delivering the letter to the Colossians is this runaway servant, this runaway slave, Paul says... Uh, by the way, when you see him, you know, let's not have this be business as usual. And so that's kind of the reason, that's the occasion for the letter. Pretty interesting. And again, you're not going to find a lot in the way of, of um, doctrinal things. Interesting, though, because, like, again, if there's going to be repentance, then, uh, of course, there's going to be, you know, forgiveness and restoration. And even Paul uh, addresses and deals with restitution. You know, if, if it costs you something, then put it on my account. Now, when we get to a particular verse here, there, there are two different views of this. Uh, and one of them might be, is Paul being a little almost playful at, uh, at one point, you know, kind of exercising a bit of a sense of humor, or is he being serious? Now, you'll notice that he doesn't come with 
this apostolic authority of you must do this. It's just, hey, friend to friend, Philemon, you got saved during my ministry, more than likely at Ephesus, but wherever it was, you were saved there. And so, you know, just remember our relationship. I come to you as a friend on behalf of another person, someone that we have in common, but much has changed since he left. A, he got born again, and B, he's been really, really useful in ministry to me, and he's an important person to me, just as you're an important person to me. So that's kind of the background for the actual letter itself. And so uh, we'll take a look at the text in just a moment. But that gives you a little bit of it. And uh, it's unique in that it's just a personal letter. Now, it's not totally uncommon, but you can can look at the the letter that was written to Timothy was very personal. So was the the one to Titus. The the letters of Luke and, uh, uh, or actually the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were both written by Luke to uh, Theophilus. But they're full of doctrine and theology and all the rest of that. This is just personal stuff, which makes it kind of interesting that it would be, you know, in the regular text of the Bible because it's not going to be teaching a lot of doctrine, but it does teach a lot about relationship. So kind of interesting. With that said, let's, uh, let's get to Philemon. If you're still thinking, well, where is Philemon? You didn't even mention it because it's only on one page in some of your Bibles probably. <laughs> so uh, just remember, we've been working our way through the New Testament, so just go to Titus and turn right. How's that work? Okay, so Philemon. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and uh, for the, the things that we can learn from this. Uh, though it's not filled with doctrine and theology, what it does, it speaks a lot about the relationship that we have person to person and the relationship that we have in you. We would ask, Lord, that you would glorify yourself through the teaching of your word here tonight and the things that we can see by this very personal letter from one person to another. God, if we could see the idea of of restoration, even when perhaps wrong has been done and realizing that once we become yours, that maybe some of the old rules just really don't apply. So we ask, Lord, that you would glorify yourself again in this place tonight. We thank you for time of worship. We pray now that as we take this time in your word that you would uh, find us having hearts ready to receive. We give you thanks for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen? So Paul mentions himself here in verse 1 as a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother. So it of course mentions Timothy, which would have been a, a very prominent uh, kind of traveling companion. We know who he is, obviously it's the same Timothy that the epistles were written to. But I, I want to make sure that we understand something too about Paul, and we probably already know this, but it doesn't hurt to repeat it. We know that he was in his imprisonment, but he recognized the reason for his imprisonment. He didn't get thrown in jail because of Jesus. It is more that since he had indentured himself to Jesus, he saw himself as being the person that was imprisoned and, and he found himself as being someone who was attached to even the, the person that has, uh, it was the message of, of the Lord and what God had done in him that caused the imprisonment. I, I don't think I really conveyed that the way that I wanted to. The point is, he wouldn't be in jail if it wasn't for his relationship that he had with the Lord. That's probably the best way of trying to explain it. So he didn't see himself as being a prisoner of Rome. He saw himself as being a prisoner of the Lord. And it was because of his service to him that he saw his imprisonment. That was the context for it. That's kind of the way I wanted to, that, that sounds more like what I wanted to say. So you find him recognizing that. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. It was because of his representation of God that he finds himself in this place. And then he says to Philemon, this is who he addresses it to, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Now, we know that uh, he mentions him as being one that was saved under Paul's ministry. So Philemon is a person who would know Paul in a personal sense, and Paul's writing back, and he's using that opportunity to remind him that we're just fellows here. We are are partners. There's, uh, in verse 17, he uses the the same kind of phrasing again, and we'll get to that in a moment. And then in verse 2, again, all the speculation, 
to the beloved Aphia, which seems to be his wife, and then this Archippus, which they don't know, maybe that's his son, could be the pastor that's there, you know, somebody in a place of prominence there, but certainly somebody known to Paul, to Philemon, and more than likely people in his family. But he refers to this Archippus guy as being a fellow soldier. So that's why some people speculate that he was maybe, uh, did ministry, maybe a pastor. Anyways, it says, and then to the church in your house. How churches have changed, huh? Well, in verse 3 he says, Now grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as I was reading through this, again, the, the opening of all of Paul's epistles, you can read through them really quick. It's going to be grace, peace, grace, peace, mercy, you know, and, it, and it's just almost like the, the typical greeting. But I thought to myself as I looked at this, grace to you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine if we all greeted one another that same way? So you see somebody like, man, I'm praying or I'm, I'm wishing grace upon you. Not only that it's to you, but that, that peace would also be a part of it. Grace is, is, again, I'm praying that God gives you a bunch of stuff that you don't deserve. And I'm praying that you have a bunch of peace. And it's, I'm, giving, I, I'm, I'm wishing this towards you in the name of or from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that Paul would ever say anything idly. I think he meant every, every single word of what he said. But the thoughtfulness behind that is kind of impressive because he also talks about praying for him. And he does that with how many of the other epistles? Hey, every time we think of you, we pray for you. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ashamed of myself almost daily at how little time I probably put towards prayer that I need to. Sometimes you think, if I prayed for every person, every place, everything that I can think of, that's all that I would do all day. Wouldn't be a bad way to use my time, I'm sure. But, you know, who's got that amount of time? And then when you miss the mark on it, how do you feel about that? But I just picture, I mean, when Paul says this, either he's not being totally honest or he is being totally honest. I think you would probably find Paul praying if he wasn't walking somewhere, he was probably praying, or doing both, perhaps. Well, interesting. He says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and your faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus and towards the saints. Now, he does this in a number of other places, too, where you can see that he keeps tabs on the churches and even on the people who are in those churches. Think through Paul's epistles. We hear about you. What's going on in your church is spoken about with some of the people that come through town. Remember, he had talked about that in the, uh, I think it wanted, I want to say it was uh, of the Philippians and of the, uh, of the people in Thessalonica. There were people that were traveling from up in that area and he was hearing about what was going on with them. So Paul keeping tabs. And that's where you, I think you get a good understanding of his pastoral heart wanting to know how things are going in all of those churches. And then think about all the places that he visited, all the people that he had met, and knowing them enough to say that, hey, now i got a chance to write something to you. It's going to be, since we're already there at Colossae and already delivering this letter to you there at Colossae, now here is something personally. Imagine Paul when he's handing this off to him and said, hey, when you give this to the church at Colossae, I need you to go over and see Philemon and hand this paper to him. Can you imagine being Onesimus? I mean, this is the guy that, hey, you could end up getting you know, beaten. You could get thrown in prison. You've run away as a slave. That was like a big deal. Now, you're going to go hand this to your former master not knowing for sure how it's going to go. But having something like this from Paul probably would make him feel a little bit better about going back because I don't suppose a lot of people knowing who Paul was would say, forget it, I don't care what Paul says. You imagine that? Well, he says, I hear about your love. I hear about your faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus Christ and towards the saints. And I do also believe this, that if Paul knows that about Philemon, I don't think that he was really fearful to send Onesimus back to him, especially accompanied by this letter with the testimony of Paul about what's taken place in this man's life. I think that at this point, if you're Philemon, you're thinking this guy left and possibly even ripped him off in the past. Now if he's being sent back and, and he's a disciple of Paul, isn't this the guy that you want in your house? I mean, think about that. So he says in verse 6 that, the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement 
of every good work which is in you in Jesus Christ. So again, this, this prayerful, here's where I'm praying takes place. I'm praying that there is an effectiveness because of an acknowledgement. People see what's taking place in your life, so I'm praying that, that it, it, it impacts your evangelism and the, the ability of your message to get across. So he says in verse 7, For we have great joy and we have consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. Again, he hears about what's happening with Philemon, and it brings comfort to him. Now, as a pastor, there are people who have left from here from time to time, moved to other places in the country, and it is kind of cool to hear back from them after some time and hear that they're doing well. It's great to get a letter or a card or an email. Yeah, we get those now, or even a phone call. And uh, for somebody to say, you know, we, we miss you guys down there, but we know that things are going well. Here's what's happening with us. There's nothing more comforting than to know if somebody has left this place, that where they've gone, that there's fruit being born there too. And so I can, I, I can understand where Paul says this. So we have this great joy and we have this consolation. It's the Greek word paraklesis where we get that's the same kind of, uh, it's the same family of word where we get that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the, as, as the paracletos. So the one who comes alongside, the one who comforts. And so that same thing, there's a comfort that comes from hearing about your love. Now, verse 8 says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ commanding uh, to command you what is fitting, now I could throw my weight around as Paul the Apostle, but instead, he says in verse 9, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know which one would hold more weight. Imagine yourself, if you're Philemon, and you're just reading this for the first time. Now, of course, in English, uh, we read the words, but if we want to try to get the intent of the words... Paul in verse 8 says, now I could come to you as Paul the Apostle and start ordering you around. However, in verse 9, yet for the sake of love, so I don't feel like I'm bullying you into something, I'm going to appeal to your loving and your gentle kind of a spirit. What's more compelling? Now, if he says that you've got this loving, compassionate kind of a spirit, and as soon as Onesimus comes back, you throw him in jail. <laughs> it would seem to almost be somewhat contradictory. So if you're, if you're Philemon, I don't think Paul's trying to bully him into it, and I don't think he's playing games with him either and really kind of shoving him into a corner. I think he's being genuine here. But boy, when he says, I'm going to appeal to you for love's sake, this would be the right thing for you to do. Look at what he says. Being such as one, you know, Paul, again, mentioning who he is, I could talk to you as the, as the apostle, but I'm talking to you as Paul and you know, this, I'm this, this aged guy, and he says, now I'm also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It would be easy to say, well, I feel so sorry for him. How could I say no? Because Paul's going to make a request of him based upon this young man. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. And then again, that's him being able to say, while I've been here in my imprisonment, that one who ran away from you, God has brought us together, and now this young man is saved. And I'm coming to you, not pushing you around as the apostle. I'm talking to you as Paul the aged, the one who is here in my imprisonment. But while I've been here, a guy you may know, Onesimus, came to me, and he got born again. Now, not just some brand new believer. Remember, this guy is going to be one of the two people that's carrying the letter to the Ephesians and to the Colossians. And then this one here is going to be delivered uh, at the same time. So Paul sends this out and he says, verse 11, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. So since he's become saved, since he's born again, God not only has saved him, but now he is also, he's brought him into ministry and he's useful to me. He will certainly be useful to you. Now there are some that speculate that when Philemon got this, there, there's no history on this. Again, we're reading about something here that really there's nothing before it or after it. This is just, it's dropped right in here in this part of the New Testament. So we don't know anything that happened after this. But there are some that speculate that after Philemon would have read this, it's like, well, I've been doing without him for, for all this time anyway. 
Paul, you're there in your imprisonment. If he's useful to you and you're able to send him out and he's that trustworthy, it would be better that he's used by you and used of God elsewhere rather than just locked up in this little place. But, you know, again, speculation. It's all that it gives. But Paul does recognize that this person was unprofitable to you. How do we know that? Well, he ran away. He left. And he left not only a, a, you know, just down the street. If Paul is genuinely in Rome in his imprisonment, he left a long ways away. Chances are it's not Ephesus. I, some have said maybe Paul's imprisonment may have been at Ephesus. And that's kind of hard to imagine because it was so close. It would be easy to track down something like that. Some think that he may have actually been at Caesarea. Okay, so in, in, uh, um, in Israel. However it is, we know that Paul was definitely in an imprisonment. There's no question. The reason that they think it might be closer is what we see at the end of this because Paul was saying, hey, make a room for me because I'm going to get there to you soon. That's my expectation. So as we continue on, verse 11, this was a person who was at one time unprofitable to you, but now. So there is the then and there is the now. Again, if we're going to try to find little nuggets, if you will, out of what this is, don't you love it if you, hopefully, you are able to look at your life when you first got saved, or even certainly before you got saved, and then look at yourself now and say, unprofitable back then, but as far as God is concerned, certainly profitable now. Now, we don't look at ourselves as being anything other than what God has made us into. There's no doubt about that. But again, wouldn't it be nice if each of us, or shouldn't we, be able to say what is being said of Onesimus here in verse 11 should be able to be said of every single believer. A time when we were unprofitable, a time now that we are profitable to the Lord, and then to, in this case, uh, to Philemon. Well, he says he's not only profitable to you, but he's also profitable to me. So I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart. It is... My desire that when he comes back to you that you receive him back in as though nothing has taken place. Now, there seems to have been wrong. If nothing else, there would have been the loss of, of the going wage of a slave. It costs something to purchase them. And if he was just a regular everyday you know, just a, a laborer of some sort without any kind of skill, it wouldn't have necessarily, well, it would have been expensive, sure, but if this was a really skilled guy, it could have really hurt the well-being of this particular guy. We don't know any of these details. We don't know what his skills were. So, at least if nothing else, the lack of this person would have had some kind of an effect on Philemon. Well, it says, whom I wished to keep with me. Now he's profitable, remember? He's profitable to you, but he's also profitable to me. And he says, now, I wish to keep him with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel's sake. I thought very long and hard about just keeping him here with me. But then Paul realized, not the right thing to do. And this, again, may be one of those reasons why Philemon might have said, hey, he's profitable, Paul's in his chains, I'm not this is not a bad thing. Now, there are some people that, th that uh, uh, look at this and they say, well, was Onesimus, was he also enslaved there? Was he or also imprisoned? Well, Paul wouldn't have been able to send him back because Paul wouldn't have had the power to get him out of jail, if you will. But it seems as though this was known to Paul, wasn't known to very many other people. So Paul's able to send him back. And so, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. So if you send him back to me, it's not because you felt browbeat by me, Paul, or because I've played upon your sympathies as saying that I'm a prisoner or anything else, and I just want to hold on to him because you wouldn't have had any knowledge of it. If he's going to continue to serve with me here in my chains, it's going to be because you're okay with it. You've given your consent. So, Paul says this, he says, for, ha or for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. So it may very well be that you don't send him back to me, it may very well be that he stays with you, and that's fine. He's going to be profitable no matter what. Whether it's here or there, it will be to the glory of God. And then Paul gets again to the point where he says, no longer as a slave, but more than that a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if he's going to stay there with you, 
here again, this is the change that has taken place. Again, the old rules don't apply. If he comes back to you with all that has taken place in him and all the things that have done have happened since he left, how God has poured into him, he's not just someone else, but he's actually a fellow brother in the Lord. And remember, Paul is saying to, to Philemon, uh, let's make sure we all understand this. We are all ultimately servants. So Paul, even of all of his reputation. And none of us in this room will ever be, you know, will never have the kind of effect, if you will, I don't think, that Paul did, obviously. None of us are going to go ahead and write scripture. He wrote a whole bunch of it. We're never going to travel to the places that he did, and we're never going to see the kind of results that happened from his ministry. This is a unique person. But notice Paul's way of, of discussing these things. He didn't see himself as anything more than he ultimately was. Hey, I'm a servant serving the Lord even to the point of change. You're a servant because God has set you free from the life that you had had before he came into your life. Now he's done it with Onesimus. Let's realize that we are all on the same plane here. God uses us in different ways. And so he's able to say to him, no longer, don't view this young man any longer, or this man, any longer as a slave, but more than that. Well, what else would be more than just a slave? Well, he's a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more now to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Paul had, if you will, in a spiritual sense, as a pastor to both of these, birthed them, if you will. Or he was their, he was their father figure. He was their discipler. And so they were the people that were under him. And just, can you imagine? You haven't seen the guy for a long time. Again, you're not getting a phone call from Paul. Hey, I'm going to send Onesimus back to you and just make sure you treat him real nice. The Lord's done a lot of stuff. Just remember that by the time that he is handing this letter to him, he's seeing Paul or he's seeing uh, Philemon face to face. That would probably be a pretty nervous thing. So anyway, it would have been a kind of simultaneous thing. Imagine if they sees him face to face before he hands the paper to him. I mean, just you, you can your mind can go a lot of different ways with this because we don't know. But imagine if you're this guy taking it back to this guy because we don't know what their relationship was like before this. None of that stuff is, is told to us. None of it is there. But I can imagine that had been kind of nervous. Well, especially, more than just a brother, more than just a slave, rather, but a brother, especially to me. Now, if you then count me as a partner, then receive him. This partner is, uh, is uh, koinonos, where we get koinonia, that fellowship that goes on. Now, Paul says, look, if you look at me as a partner, if you look at me as someone who is a fellow to you, then I'm hoping that you view these things the way that I view these things. And so he says to them, so then if you count me as a partner, then receive him as you would me. Now, here again, maybe this is the part where Paul's kind of having some fun with this. Or he may be just like totally sincere. I th he would be sincere both ways, but... Uh, in the next verse, you're going to find the way that he phrases this whole thing is like, what real option do you have here, Philemon? I don't think that you're going to say no because you would look like a really bad guy. But he says in verse 17, now if you count me as a partner, if you think that, that you can look at me as an equal or someone that we're on the same page, then just receive him as you would me. Don't treat him any differently than if it was me coming with him. Now Paul probably would have, but Paul is in prison. So he says, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, then put that at my account. I'll take care of it. That's the idea of restitution. Now, what he says in the verse right after this would be a, a thing where when Philemon reads it, it's like, how could I possibly ask Paul? Now, again, what's Paul going to pay it with? He's in prison. The point is, would you require something of me considering that if we're going to talk about who should owe whom what, look at what he says in verse 19. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, but not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self. <laughs> now, besides. What that means is that if you're going to say no, let's remember that there is a little indebtedness here that you have even to me. And I, I kind of think that this is said a bit tongue-in-cheek. And the reason why, Paul would never be able to give any kind of, uh, of, of reason why 
uh, Philemon owes his salvation to Paul. That's, of course, because of the Lord. But again, I think he's kind of laying it on a little bit here and saying it a little bit tongue-in-cheek. If you're going to hold something to his account, then we can all start trying to settle up things. Because I've done a lot for you too, Philemon. Now, if that's the way that he is saying it, it becomes almost a little bit playful and saying, how could you say no other than to say, yeah, I'll receive you back in. And whatever wrong there was, let's just bygones be bygones. Let's let the old things be old things. All the rules have changed. Because more than likely, Philemon and his servant Onesimus were both unsaved at one point. Paul now had a part in each of their lives. One got saved wherever Paul was in his imprisonment, and the other one, more than likely, Philemon, probably got saved at Ephesus. But however it is, both of them would be able to say, where did you first hear the gospel and who led you to the Lord? Both would point to Paul. So Paul would say, if I'm sending him back and I'm vouching for him and I'll make good on whatever it was, let's remember just who we are and what God has done. And, you know, if it's not a big deal to me, it shouldn't be a big deal to you. And so he says, you can even put it on my account if you need to do that. Now, verse 20 says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. I'm, I'm hoping that when I hear back, and of course, then he ends up throwing one other kicker in here. Oh, by the way, I'm going to come by for a visit. <laughs> so in verse 20, he's able to say, let me have joy from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. I'm just praying that when this all comes full circle, that everything's been done as it should be. There's no reason not to receive him back. There's no reason to have an accounting or be petty in any way. Just receive him back in because he wants to do the right thing as well. He could have stayed gone. Or, you know, when Paul would have said, hey, I think it's time for you to go back there and try to make things right. He could have ran the other way. But Onesimus is no problem. I'm going, I'll do this, and we'll just see how it's received. And so Paul is doing the, the best that he can to really vouch for this, this, this man. Now, verse 21, it says, having confidence in your obedience. So again, if, <laughs> if you're reading this and you're Philemon, how do you say no? Look at how he's phrasing these things. Now, again, I don't think Paul is going to coerce him because he's even saying as much. But it does appeal to the sense of right and wrong. It does appeal a bit to the sense of justice here. So he's able to say to them, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So I don't have fear that you won't make good on this. I have confidence in you. Again, can you just imagine reading this? If you wanted to be upset with the guy, but you don't know what he did. Well, yeah, I do. And isn't it funny how this is, this is where it becomes kind of a personal thing with us. And I was talking with somebody on the phone just a little bit earlier, and you know, a lot of times we can look at, at wrongs that have been done to us and how we start to deal with all that stuff. Now, isn't it funny how we will always come to God and say, Lord, grace, peace, mercy for me but justice for them. Look at what they did, God. Look at, look at how they did the things that they did. You should repay them for the things that you've done. But boy, when it's pointed out what you've done, oh, well, grace and mercy, Lord, because, you know, I, I, I really need grace. I really need mercy. Well, what about that poor guy over there? Especially when you've got the power here. And again, here's the difference after we get saved. Isn't it amazing how we look at everything differently? Onesimus would have looked at this and said, I ran away. For whatever reasons, we know none of those things. But he has certainly come to the point of realizing it's not right. I've got to go back and face the music. I need to do the right thing. Now, fortunately, Paul looks at him and says, man, I love you with what you've done. And you've got your life together. And you're so useful in ministry and all the rest of that. But yeah, go back there. But I'll put in a good word for you. And take this letter back. Let him see it, and then we'll see how things go. Again, it's the right thing to do. It's the just thing to do. And Paul is banking on the fact that Philemon would also do the right and the just thing. But boy, can you imagine <laughs> if he's reading this and you're Onesimus sitting there and watching him read it? Can you, you know, you're trying to read his body language. Again, all we can do is try to play with this and you know have some speculation. But do you think that if you're if you're watching him read it? Man, if he frowns, you're thinking, uh-oh. Or if he shakes his head, what does that mean? It's like, man, I, I may want to just go ahead and beat this guy, but then it's going to get back to Paul. 
And Paul's already told me about all the reasons why I should receive him back, and there's no good reason why not to. How do I do this? Again, I would think, and especially because I believe God had this put in the text, I don't think we have to read any, anything into it. I believe it's very simply put like this and why this would be put in front of us. There was a man who ran away and went and God led him to Paul. This man got born again and then it was decided between them, I need to go make this right. And I think that Paul had every confidence that Philemon wouldn't have to be pushed into anything but that he would do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Forgive the brother. What he did, he did in his ignorance. Now he is in a place where there isn't any ignorance and now he's making things right. If Philemon was genuinely a disciple of Paul, he would know all of those things. He would know exactly how to do this. He wouldn't probably even need to be told and yet Paul gives him this. And imagine all the people, here's again something else, all of the collateral to this. How about the other people that are in Philemon's house? How about all the people that would be seeing this within the church and the great demonstration of, a, of an upright, righteous Christian life? Think of the, the kind of witness that this is to the world around. So I'm convinced by this, though you can't prove it, I think this went exactly the way that Paul wanted to because I think this is exactly the way that the Lord would want it to because this would be glorifying to him. Anything different than what Paul is asking wouldn't really glorify God because the flesh would get involved with it. You see? So, verse 22, But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. So, in the meantime, be praying for me and have a place prepared. And if, you know, the Lord makes it, makes it possible and sees fit to it. Now, it's an interesting thing. Did Paul get a chance to go there? Possibly, because we do know that this, when he left uh, T uh, Timothy at Ephesus, Colossae is only to the east and a little bit to the south. So he may very well have gone there. We don't know what happened between what is considered to be his first and his second imprisonment. We, we, we can only speculate that he had to have gotten out at one point because Paul and Timothy were not ever at Ephesus where Timothy stayed and Paul went on to Macedonia, which is what we get in Paul's letter to Timothy. Hey, while we were here, before I went to Macedonia, I thought it necessary to leave you in Ephesus to get some things put in, in order, get them fixed. You remember that when we were going through Timothy? So it does give the impression that Paul must have been out of his first imprisonment before his second and before his ultimate demise. So, meanwhile, I pray. I'm asking that you would prepare this room for me and pray that, that God brings me there. So, then we find the names of some other people that are familiar to us. It tells us Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you. So, Epaphras, we've seen him uh, in other places in Paul's writings. It seems that he's there in that same imprisonment. As do Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So, Luke of the Gospel. And, uh, and then he end, ends it by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and uh, with your spirit. Now, again, it's, it's an interesting book in that, did you notice that other than implied, there isn't any doctrinal things where he's saying, this you must know, this you must teach, this you must understand. He's not correcting anything. This is only and. Uh, if we if you want to take it to know what was going on, where Philemon was, go read the book of Colossians. That's Paul's admonition to what was going on at Colossae. So let's make sure that we do connect those two books together. The book of Colossae is what was taking place where Philemon lived. But this is a little bit, if you will, of housekeeping of Paul saying, while you're there, let's see if we can settle this thing between Philemon and Onesimus. But he, he does deal with a lot of doctrinal stuff in the book of Colossians, which you can look at. It. The preeminence of Jesus is central to that book of Colossians. It's been a while since we looked at it. It's, gosh, I don't even know how long it's been since we were in Colossians. But it would have been Wednesday night, that I know. And I think we did it on a Sunday morning, too, at some point in the last five or six years. But if you want to know, again, the, the kind of doctrinal theological things, you can find that in, in Colossians. This is just... 
such an interesting little addition because it's the only place where you find a truly personal letter that is free, it's independent of, of doctrine and theology. And I knew that we, we wouldn't have a full you know, one hour Bible study in this. It, there's not that much, if you will, in content, and no sense in spiritualizing it or anything else. What I do think that the best takeaway that we can have from this is very simply to look at, at if people have wronged you, well, I mean, that's just kind of the way that, that things go. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had that uh, in times where you're doing counseling and people are just blown away that somebody has done this. And times will be when they'll, they'll say, you know that so-and-so did so-and-so. And they're surprised by it. And I'm always shocked that, that when people uh, do people things, when humans act like humans, other humans get surprised. Isn't that bizarre? Like they're expecting me to say, oh, you're kidding, they act like a human being. I, I can't believe that, I'm shocked. Well, it is in our nature to be rebellious. Obviously he was, didn't like the way that things were and, and thought that there was freedom elsewhere. But notice the difference the moment that this man became really a servant or indentured, if you will, or a slave to Jesus. The word is doulos in, in, uh, in the Greek. When a person becomes indebted, if you will, to Jesus and then serves him, how different everything becomes. I don't think Onesimus was worried about going back there. may have been worried about what could happen to him, but he knew it was the right thing to do. And so what else would a believer do? Continue to run the other way or go back and, and do and, and make good on what we're supposed to do? So interesting little thing. It's, uh, you walk away from looking at this and you think, how would I have acted? What would I have done? Put myself in Philemon's place, put myself in Onesimus' place. And then uh, you know, draw your conclusions from there. Kind of interesting. So uh, very short Bible study tonight. Unusual that I don't take all the time allotted to me. But we go from here to the book of Hebrews. The first three verses of that will probably easily be one whole night because there's so much. Now, from, from something like Philemon, which doesn't have a great deal of, of uh, doctrine and theology, how many of you even think of there being a distinction between doctrine and theology? Do we all understand the difference between the two things? Okay, so sometimes they get used interchangeably. I'll just throw it out here to you really quick. When we talk about theology, the word, it's a compound word, theology. Ology is what? Study of. What is the theos? God. Studying about the nature of God, doctrine is what it is that you teach about those things. So what we're going to find is a lot of theology in the book of Hebrews, which leads to doctrine, those things that we teach. And so uh, we will see a lot of that in the book of Hebrews. Oh, I have been looking forward to doing this. It's been a long time since I've been through Hebrews. How many of you studied through that book before? How many of you studied? Oh, wow. Boy, I feel such pressure. I don't want to blow it. You guys have already, especially if you've heard it from a really good Bible teacher. Now I feel the pressure. So anyway, um, we'll start that next Wednesday night. And uh, we will be getting out of here a little bit early tonight. So uh, enjoy the evening. Is it still hot and humid and nasty outside? Are you guys not ready for fall? What in the world's going on, right? Well, I hear it's going to be nice over the weekend, but then it's getting back to the 90s next week. In the middle. What is that all about? <sighs> let's pray and let's stand. Father, we thank you that we come before you this evening and we are able to take a look at a, at a, a book that is unusual to all of us as we, as we look at it. We see the admonition from Paul to Philemon and doing the right thing, realizing that all things have changed to those that, uh, that have come into a relationship with you and the way that we may have done things in the world is not how you ask us to do them now. Even to the point of denying ourselves, uh, Onesimus' freedom, Philemon, forgiving when, uh, when otherwise he might not. Lord, may we learn those lessons of what it is to do the right thing no matter what side of the equation we're on. Lord, we pray that you would help us to recognize that as your people, we live by a different standard, one that the world will never understand. We pray, God, that we would glorify you in the things that we do, the things that we say. So we give you thanks. We give you praise for this evening. We pray that you'd get us home safely, and we pray that you'd glorify yourself in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have people down here for prayer if you need. No reason to rush out. We finished a little early tonight, so come on down if you need prayer.